This recording is protected by copyright. No part may be reproduced without the prior permission of the University of South Australia. Good evening and a very, very warm welcome to you all um, to this. It's a little chilly this evening. By goodness me, it's going to warm up. My name is Marnie Hughes-Warrington. I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of Research and Enterprise and the Standing Acting Vice-Chancellor here at UniSA and I'm absolutely thrilled to be here at our annual 3MT event. We're going to begin by um, acknowledging really the deep connections of this place and so I'm going to invite Jack Buckskin to deliver a welcome to the traditional country of the Ghana people where we're gathered here tonight. So Jack, please do come and uh, educate us. You're a great educator. <clears throat> Now, Marnie. That's amazing. That was like half the room answered that. Um, I remember when I started teaching, I'd ask the crowd, Now, Marnie, and hear crickets. Um, shows you how long, how far we've come as a, as a community to, to embrace and utilise and learn language. Uh, for those that don't know, Now, Marnie means, Are you all good? And the response to that is, Marnie, I. Um, you're probably thinking that you know no Ghana language, but you, you do. You speak language on a daily basis and don't even realise with places like Nolunga and Oldinga and Kaundilla and Yankalilla and Manapara and Paralawi and all these kind of place names that we take as suburbs now, all have specific meanings um, and we all speak in Ghana language. It's the language of the region and the country, not for the people. Us as people speak the language that, uh, uh, of this region to help us understand it. Um, and we've spent the last 40 years in revitalising and learning our mother tongue language. I haven't been around that long, but um, the elders have been around that long um, and gave the opportunity for me to, to relearn uh, my mother tongue language. And I, I identified strongly as Narunga from the York Peninsula as my family was taken to York Peninsula and Point Pierce Mission um, and was given the opportunity to leave. Uh, first, my grandfather left under an exemption certificate, which meant uh, he was no longer an Aboriginal person and he moved over to the Riverland for a number of years. Um, in 1972, we came to Adelaide um, after uh, the missions and reserves closed down um, and we became free people. Mum came here and uh, started primary school and high school and I'm the second generation to grow up in this society. So uh, mum missed out on speaking language. Um, her, her father wouldn't teach her because he was physically beaten, but. Uh, when I got the opportunity to, to start learning my mother tongue language, I asked her and, and asked her if she wanted to come along to a language class. She lasted about six weeks at the most, and then I kicked her out. Um, just don't have your mum come to your class. <laughs> don't tell me how to say that. I was like, you get out of my class. Um, and then I apologised when I got home and asked her if dinner was ready. But uh, for, for me to be able to stand and represent my family and community in, in speaking our mother tongue language is an honour as I was the first person to be able to speak language fluently, um, publicly, um, since colonisation of South Australia. So it's a long time um, and a lot of people don't realise the global influence that Ghana have and Ghana language revitalisation has on, on endangered languages around the world. And for me to be a part of that is, is a blessing, but I wouldn't be here without the elders that have gone before me. So I also pay respects to them. I pay respects to other indigenous and Aboriginal people here today. There's a lot of cultural protocols uh, very similar to us and welcome you spiritually in the place. Um, even though I welcome you to Ghana country, I pay respects to three other uh, Aboriginal heritages, Ghana on the Adelaide Plains, Naranga from the York Peninsula and Warrangal from Streaky Bay, Sejuna area. Uh, one from Victoria, we don't mention their name, they're a bit like Voldemort, we just don't say their name because um, they're Victorian, we don't care if they're family. <laughs> But my dad, Italian Scottish meal. My father is Italian and Scottish, and I, I, I stand here uh, representing my mother's side. But my father has helped make me who I am as well. Um, and you know, for us as uh, stand as First Nations people, um, and to have that voice, uh, my dad had a lot of issues and, and challenges growing up as well as uh, somebody 
um, from the Italian background, uh, growing up in those days and times is much different. My, my children are Vietnamese and English on top of that, so they're First Nations, they're multicultural. Their mum's name's Kaysan. I don't know if you can get any more Australian than that. Um, my mum's name's not Kaysan. My mum's Annette. Um, kind of boring name. Little catchy. <laughs> You'll get that one later. Um, anyway, yeah, somebody's like, oh, I just got that one. Uh, but thank you very much for allowing me to be able to be here to acknowledge our ancestors as we gather here today. We let them know that we all come as friends of country. We're not here to disturb it and ask for them to bless and look after us as we gather here today. I'm going to stick around and enjoy it. Three minutes. I probably had that time, went a little bit over. So if you go over, you get deducted points. Those that are coming up to speak, I'm not going to get deducted any points because I'm not in the grand final. Um, I didn't even get shortlisted. Um, <laughs> but thank you very much, everybody. Enjoy the rest of the night. I tell you. I think we can just all acknowledge that you're an extraordinary educator. Um, we were just talking about your contribution across multiple. Uh, levels of education from kindergartens, primary schools, TAFE through to university, this state is so much richer for the fact that you are an incredible teacher. Uh, and the way you speak Ghana reminds us all that we all have the opportunity to not just connect with country in a physical sense, but to connect via the beautiful language that you so beautifully speak this evening. So thank you for your generosity and your welcome this evening. And I think that was within three minutes, so I mean, that's pretty impressive. That's a really, you know, hard bar that you folks are going to have to meet there. All right, so welcome everybody. Uh, acknowledge this beautiful Ghana country that we stand on, the Ghana people, and thank them for the generosity of welcoming us to this space. Um, this is a really powerful night for learning about all kinds of things. I always get a big turnout, and note that the event this evening is being recorded and is being live streamed via YouTube. So if you ever want to be on YouTube, you're on YouTube. Isn't that exciting? So you might have young people in your family that just think you're much, much cooler than they thought before, which is pretty cool. Just a reminder, because we are wanting to pay attention to the people up the front and speaking, please put your phones on silent so that, you know, there's nothing distracting our wonderful speakers. Um, there's no um, need to vote immediately, um, but keep your phone by. You don't need to turn it off, but just make sure that it's on silent, thanks. And thank you very much for joining us, wherever you're coming from, and everybody in the auditorium. I want to welcome all our distinguished guests, our judges for tonight's competition, our donors, colleagues, friends, family, uh, our speakers, everyone here in the auditorium joining via live stream. What an exciting event. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. I also want to welcome the executive deans, deans research, professorial leads, members of council, uh, directors, all kinds of people from across the university, but the community as well, who join together in um, celebrating and supporting our budding researchers. Also, a particular shout out to our Chancellor Club members and our Alumni Award winner, Kate Swaffer. Now, on behalf of Jacinta Thompson, Executive Director of the Bob Hawke Prime Ministerial Centre, uh, I'm welcoming you now formally to the 2023 UniSA three-minute thesis grand final competition, a very special event in the UniSA and Hawke Centre calendars. And the first thing I want you to do with me is to just put your hands together and welcome our seven PhD student finalists. <laughs> Think you can do better? Well, probably not. And uh, as a professor, it's a very humbling experience to look at the budding researchers and think, if only I had been able to explain my research at the same level of education so clearly and concisely, my goodness, my path to my PhD would have been a lot smoother. And I'm very impressed by all of your talents. You represent the seven academic units, a very broad spectrum of research areas we undertake at the university, and you are an absolutely incredible inspiration. Um, not just for other research students, but for our community, but all of our research community and our staff. So congratulations to you for the inspiration that you give us. Now, the topics that you're going to cover tonight, all kinds of things, ways we can develop a greener future for mining, the finer points of entrepreneurship and innovation, and the wonderful things we can learn by studying our brain while it's asleep. Now, tonight's finalists are amongst the very best of UniSA's 
almost 1,000 PhD students, and they've already been through a previous round and they've won their individual academic unit 3MT competition, pretty stiff competition. Everyone we're going to hear from tonight's worked incredibly hard. You've really pushed yourselves to step outside your comfort zone and progress through the competition, and I know you've received help and you've just taken the feedback and got better and better and better. Now, distilling an entire PhD thesis into just three minutes, which could be 100,000 words, folks, so that's what we're talking about in some cases, into three minutes, and delivering that to a general audience is an incredible challenge, and our seven finalists have all embraced that superbly, so you're remarkable. Being able to communicate clearly and effectively has become really, really important for our researchers. You might notice as people publish journal papers now, they're also being asked to do short videos of their journal papers to explain their work to general audiences. And of course, if you watch the news on any night of the week, you'll see UniSA's researchers explaining research over and over again on all kinds of things. It is an expectation that we don't just do this research because we find it interesting. We actually want to do research because we want to change society and we want to improve the economy. And part of that is actually being able to explain it to other people and to be able to support them to adopt those ideas. Now, tonight's winner will progress to the 3MT Asia-Pacific semi-finals to represent UniSA at the next stage of the competition. So best luck to all of you. But before we begin, I'd like to acknowledge and thank Jacinta Thompson, Executive Director of the Bob Hawke Prime Minister Ministerial Centre, for again co-hosting this event. Thank you, Jacinta, and including it in the Hawke Centre's very popular public events program. Thank you to all the people that have come along tonight, uh, the loyal friends of the Hawke Centre, and any visitors from the public who will be new to these events. We hope that this will be interesting to you. If you've been to a few, we hope you'll come back again. If it's new, please come back again. As ever, the Hawke team have been fantastic in hosting this event, and a big thank you to Renee Jolly and Cara Zanotti from the centre, who've been really supportive and incredibly helpful. I'd also like to thank the many volunteers who are helping tonight with lots of different things to make it run smoothly. A special thank you to our amazing audio, visual and IT gurus, Adam Leahy and Shane McCarthy. And last but not least, I'd like to acknowledge and thank Dr. Kirsty Turner, whose tireless efforts, fantastic organisational skills and attention to detail over very many months, and I can tell you she does because she reports on this all the way through the year, means that this is an incredibly well-organised event and she supports and really, really loves watching, seeing what's coming up through the academic units. It's an incredible event. So, Kirsty, thank you for all your hard work this evening. Okay. Give me great pleasure to introduce you to your MC for tonight, respected journalist. UniSA PhD candidate and winner last year, Lainey Anderson. Now, you, her PhD research is exploring the life of South Australia's Kate Cox, who in 1915 became the first policewoman in the British Empire employed with the same salary and arrest powers as men. So she won, she stormed home to victory last year for history. That was really good. <laughs> and as a columnist for Adelaide Sunday Mail since 2007, Lainey is an ambassador with the Hutt Street Centre. She sits on the South Australian Regional Selection Committee of the Winston Churchill Memorial Trust. Earlier this year, she was announced as the 2023 Emerging Historian of the Year by the History Council of South Australia. Please welcome, uh, join me in welcoming Lainey to the stage, your MC. Come on up. Hi, um, I've got to say this room is a lot less terrifying with a printed script and no clock ticking down to three minutes. Ah, that was terrifying. But it's, it's not that terrifying, guys, don't worry. <laughs> um, thank you, Marnie, for those very kind words. I'd like to join Marnie in acknowledging that we're on Ghana land and pay tribute to the Ghana people who have been sharing knowledge on this part of the planet for tens of thousands of years. Um, I'd also like to join Marnie in acknowledging these amazing seven finalists that we've got tonight. I can only say how glad I am that I competed last year because I've heard them and they are awesome. You're in for such a treat, everybody. Um, and yes, you are winners because you have distilled your thesis already into three minutes and you've leaned into what is actually quite a considerable challenge. So yay, guys, well done. Um, thank you all for joining us tonight um, in this auditorium and also online. Hi, if you're watching. Um, it's not mum this year, but hi, anyway, everyone up there. Um, let's get into this because um, you're not here to see me. Our judging panel, hello, down the front. Um, our chair of the judging panel 
The Honourable John Hill needs absolutely no introduction to anyone um, who is a follower of South Australian politics. Um, John was Minister for Health and Minister for Arts for many years under the, um, geez, how soon we forget, RAN and Wetherill governments, <laughs> um, and led many um, amazing reforms, including the SAMRI and the new RA. Dr Laura Hodgson is another, oh, I've got my glasses on. Laura Hodgson, Hodgson is Principal Ec Economic Advisor at the City of Adelaide and last year completed, completed her own PhD at UniSA Business examining the impact of Airbnb on Australia's housing markets. Our third judge tonight is Professor David War, the inaugural Pro Vice Chancellor for Health and Medical Research and Engagement at UniSA as well as an internationally respected prostate cancer researcher committed to finding therapies in treating men with prostate cancer. Claire Petty, our fourth judge, actually studied science before becoming a science journalist. Who knew you could do that? And recently joined the conversation as Environment and Energy Deputy Editor after 15 years as a highly respected reporter here uh, in Adelaide with the Advertiser. Welcome all and sincere thanks for your support tonight. Um, and yes, you've got a hard task ahead. Next to our competition particulars. So you might not know that the first 3MT was held at the University of Queensland in 2008. A very clever university dean, he probably came up with it in the shower, come to think of it, because the idea um, was dreamed up during a severe drought when people were encouraged to have three minute timers in their showers to conserve water. So the three minute thesis was born and competitions are now held in over 900 universities across more than 85 countries. So our aim is to take complex research, as Marnie said, and communicate it in less than three minutes in a fashion that a non-specialist audience can understand. The rules are simple, just one static PowerPoint slide, no additional electronic media or props, competitors exceeding three minutes are disqualified, and I went very close to that last year, um, eek. But Kelly, our timekeeper, is down here with a digital clock that counts down to let the finalists know how they're tracking. All decisions are final, and John Hill was a hard taskmaster, so I wouldn't like to argue with him anyway. Um, and obviously, as Marnie said, just one rule for you lot, and that's all mobile phones on silent, please. Judging criteria, now that relies on these three fundamentals you, you can see on the screen. Um, where our finalists are judged on communication, comprehension, comprehension and engagement. So, we're ready. Now to the 3MT final. You'll find full bios of each finalist in your brochure. So tonight I'm simply announcing their name, their academic unit and the title of their talk. Between each of the talks, we'll just give the judges just a couple of moments to do their marking and then we'll move on to the next contestant. So first up, please welcome Sindrani Dars, representing UniSA Allied Health and Human Performance on the topic, Step It Up how people use podiatry services after chemotherapy. Surviving cancer must be such good news to return to a normal life without worrying about fighting cancer. But what if I told you that this may not be completely good news? As for many, a monster is lurking. Preventing the return to a normal life due to the long-lasting consequences of the cancer treatment itself, the chemotherapy. Chemotherapy is aimed to kill fast-growing cancer cells, but it also affects the skin, hair, nails, and most importantly, the nerves, leading to a condition called chemotherapy-induced peripheral neuropathy. This neuropathy mainly affects the nerves in the legs, meaning a person's ability to sense, feel, and react to stimuli as normal is gone below their knees. Now, the current cancer survival rate in Australia is 70%. Great, but unfortunately, this neuropathy affects around 50% of cancer survivors for up to three years after their chemo, 
or in some cases, it can be lifelong. Imagine surviving a deadly cancer, but then to live with severe nerve pain, electric shock-like symptoms, or not being able to feel the limbs at all. Think of what this can do to our ability to drive, or our ability to stand and walk without falling over. Or worse, imagine stepping on a piece of broken glass and not feeling it, with that injury leading to infection, ulceration, and possible amputation. In fact, neuropathy similar to this as seen in diabetes is one of the leading causes of non-traumatic lower limb amputations in Australia. Now, obviously, saving a life from cancer is the priority, and it should be. But we know that there's no cure and prevention for this neuropathy. We can at least manage the symptoms better. And anecdotally, podiatrists like myself have been doing it for years with research showing that our intervention can reduce the falls and amputations. But sadly, none of the current guidelines on the management of this neuropathy incorporate podiatry care. Hence, in my PhD, I'm looking, I have uh, gathered consensus-based recommendations from Australian podiatrists on how to best manage this neuropathy. And now I'm looking at state data to compare podiatry service use before and after chemotherapy, which clearly suggests underutilization. My aim is to advocate for cancer survivors so they can return to a life closer to normal by incorporating preventative podiatry care during their chemotherapy so that if this monster arrives, it can be tamed. Thank you. Sindrani, that was awesome. Finalist two tonight is Hayley Caldwell, representing UniSA Justice and Society on the topic, Recreating the Sleeping Brain During Wake, a comparison of memory mechanisms used to learn. I'm about to give you the quickest nap of your life with the help of this chair named Steve. Now don't worry, I'm not about to snap my fingers and switch your brain off because one, neuroscientist can't do that yet. And two, our brains don't actually switch off when we go to sleep. Instead, during the deepest parts of our sleep, our brain is actively working away to reactivate our memories of the things we learned that day, to then cement those memories into our brains. It's broadly understood that these memory cementing mechanisms only occur during sleep. That is, until some recent theories have suggested we might be able to recreate these same memory cementing mechanisms during wake instead, using some memory training. That way we can still cement memories into our brains even when we're not sleeping well. Now, do we remember the name of our chair up here? If the name Steve just came into your head or out of your mouth, then congratulations! You reactivating your memory of Steve the chair just recreated those same memory cementing mechanisms that would typically occur during a nap. Or so the theories say. We aren't actually entirely sure that these mechanisms are the same between wake and sleep, as nobody has tested them side by side yet and compared them. That's where my PhD project comes in. I get participants into my lab to learn object word pairs, like our chair Steve pairing up here. After they've learned these pairs, they then either have a nap or they do our memory training from before, where they're given part of the pair, chair, and have to recall the rest of the pair in their mind, Steve. While they're doing this napping or this memory training, I record their participants' electrical brain activity to see if these mechanisms that are cementing these memories are the same between wake and sleep, or if not, where they differ. If my results show that using this memory training, we can still cement memories using the same mechanisms that sleep does, then this can help challenge some of the leading theories in sleep and memory neuroscience that assume that these mechanisms only occur during sleep. Instead, if I find that the way our brains cement memories actually differs across wake and sleep, then we can use this to shape new theories of memory cementing that actually account for these wake and sleep differences. Knowing that we may not always need sleep to create lasting memories can help shape our education so that even the tired students can keep up with the rest of their class. 
It can also help us in our everyday lives, from the shift workers who still want to create strong memories, to people like me who might need to stay up all night to cram for their three-minute thesis the next day, <laughs> to all of us here, so that even when we're not sleeping well, we can always remember the name of our new favourite chair. Just awesome, Hayley, well done. Finalist number three, please welcome Rachel Lever, representing UniSA Education Futures. On the topic, harmful sexual behaviours displayed by children, police responses and diversions. This is Joey. Joey is a 12-year-old boy, and it has just been brought to light that Joey has been sexually abusing his eight-year-old brother. Police have attended, and they've taken Joey into their custody. Joey's entire family, including his eight-year-old brother, are absolutely distraught at the thought that Joey could be imprisoned. It has been disclosed that Joey is from a home in which domestic violence and neglect are prevalent, and Joey himself a victim of child sexual abuse. This year, the Australian Child Maltreatment Study reported that children under the age of 18 inflict the highest proportion of child sexual abuse. Now, we don't use the term sexual assault or abuse when we discuss children displaying such behaviours. We use the term harmful sexual behaviours. And harmful sexual behaviours are behaviours displayed by or between children or young people that are developmentally and socially inappropriate, and they often have negative outcomes. These behaviours can vary, and some examples might be excessive self-stimulation, viewing or showing pornography, coercive and even non-consensual sex acts. But what must be remembered in this instance is the behaviours being displayed are being displayed by children, and children are cognitively very different to that of adults, and often they are children, just like Joey, who have come from a background of other trauma. So what have police got to do with this? Well, having been a police officer for almost two decades, what I can tell you is that police, like myself, are usually one of the first points of contact for children who are engaging in these types of behaviours. And police, when dealing with children and young people, can often use a wide range of discretion, and how police respond can play a fundamental role in the outcome for these young people. Current justice system involvement, which absolutely can include incarceration, is known to increase reoffending and restrict rehabilitation outcomes where therapeutic-based interventions are best known to address these types of behaviours. Now, my research aims to investigate current police responses and attitudes to these behaviours, as well as the use of police discretion and their ability to divert children engaging in these behaviours. My study involves an Australian-wide survey of police officers and follow-up interviews. And though my data collection is in its infancy at present, what has already been seen is that police attitudes not only influence response, it also influences their willingness to use discretion. Police knowledge, the availability of resources and current legislation also have an impact on the use of police discretion and on their ability to divert children from the justice system. My research is about preventing children like Joey from being ingrained within that justice system and looking at alternative therapeutic pathways that can best address these types of behaviours. Child protection is everyone's responsibility and every single child deserves our protection. Wow, congratulations, Rachel. Finalist number four is Daniel Johnston, representing UniSA Clinical and Health Sciences. Please welcome Daniel. Daniel's talking on the topic of cancer stories in education. Think of a time when you thought to yourself, if only people had just listened to me and my experience, you would have understood the situation better and achieved a better outcome to the problem you were facing. Well, in the cancer setting, we have made tremendous advancements in how we treat and manage such a complex disease by listening to scientists and medical experts. But who we haven't been listening to as well is the people actually experiencing cancer and on the other side of those treatments. And with their experience, they can offer us great insights into how we can advance patient care and communication. And one way in which we can do so is that through the education space. 
Now, programs do exist where people impacted by cancer are able to come and share their stories with students in a hope that students will take something away from it and be better for the experience. But a lot of these programs exist with little to no input from our lived experience experts and also have a lack of direction in what they aim to achieve. So the question is simple. When we hand over complete control to the experts in this situation, what is the outcome? And so the great power of this study is that not only are we including people impacted by cancer to be participants in the research, but to also advise and guide the way the research has evolved as the process has gone along. And it also includes being carried out by myself as a cancer survivor. So in the first study, I interviewed 21 people and asked them the question, if you were given complete control of the classroom, how would you use your experience to educate healthcare students on patient care? And that included everything from the environment they wish to teach in, the content they wish to teach, and the outcomes they hope to achieve for themselves and for students. And what was interesting is that when it came to the outcomes, there was a lot of discussion around the use of reflection type practices. So that has helped inform our second study where we've been able to go out and see what research has actually been done in the way reflection has been used by healthcare students after engaging with someone impacted by cancer, be that in the clinical or education setting. And there isn't much. But that has provided us an opportunity in our third study to explore this concept further. So we can take everything we learned from our first study, create an environment in which people impacted by cancer can come in and share their story their way with their outcomes in mind, and then we can have half of the healthcare students undertake a generic reflection exercise, and the other half undertake a reflection exercise that has been guided and informed by our lived experience experts. Then we can compare and contrast the depth of critical thinking and reflection they are able to achieve by doing so, and hopefully it is greater when we use an informed and guided approach. So when all is said and done, not only have we listened to people impacted by cancer and their experience to empower them to be leaders and educators in the healthcare space, but we have also ensured that future healthcare providers have an enriched learning experience that might just help us advance the way we look at patient care. Thank you. It's just awesome to see the breadth of topics, isn't it? It's so inspiring to see what happens across all of the different academic units particularly if you're just in studying one particular little area, you don't ever sort of see what goes on and then you come to something like this and you go, wow, there is so much going on at UniSA, I love it. It's just amazing and I'm really glad I'm not a judge. <laughs> Finalist number five tonight is Alita Nuryani, representing my unit, UniSA Creative, on the topic Architecture and Culture, a study of Batawi spatial qualities in modern Jakarta. In my modern home, I often see my mom sleeping on the floor. It was her mom's habit to stay safe during a deadly plague in her village. Apparently, evil spirit cannot bend down to harm those sleeping on the floor. Now, every time my mom feels unwell, she will sleep on the floor. This is the 19th century Batawi houses, the ethnic group of Jakarta. Back then, the Batawi had space to greet their guests outside, but now the Batawi have sold most of their lands and live in a crowded urban space. Yet, they adapted small verandas to continue greeting their guests outside. These examples show us that culture is not fixed but a live experience adapting to changing physical forms. Unfortunately, there is minimal research exploring how cultural heritage is practiced in modern houses. Most experts condemn physical changes when discussing culture and architecture. The Batawi are victims of this debate. Experts want them to preserve these traditional forms, assuming it is the only way to preserve the culture. The emphasis on the physical form had diminished the notion that culture is represented in everyday routine. The problem lies in the assumptions that culture has been lost along with its traditional forms. This is where my research will contribute, to find out how modern Batawi houses may hold intangible cultural heritage in everyday urban Jakarta. How? 
by analyzing the correlations between physical forms, routine, and feelings. My research involved observing modern Batawi houses and everyday routine in urban Jakarta and asking the Batawi about their feelings and memories of homes. My analysis on traditional Batawi houses uncovers cultural significance of water on verandas alongside with um, recreation and entertaining guests. Then I will see whether these cultural practices continue to live today. With this knowledge, I can suggest the future home design that honors the Batawi cultural heritage, but also functional for the Batawi whose culture changes and adapts to circumstances. More broadly, my research can help us understand that ordinary things you do at home may have cultural meanings that are important for your future home design, just like the Batawi and my mom. Brilliant work, Alita. Just two finalists to go, so people's choice is going to be tough. Finalist number six, please welcome Roop Kaur, representing UniSA STEM, on the topic Peptides for a Greener Future, Boosting Mining's Sustainability. Mining. Mining often raises environmental concerns, such as destruction and depletion of our Mother Earth. But let me ask you something. Do you own a mobile phone? Do you drive a battery-operated car? Do you have solar panels on your roof? If your answer to any of these questions is yes, then sorry to break it to you, you're using way too many rare earth metals. The reality is that we rely on many metals, rare metals and minerals in our daily lives that even if we recycle these resources, the growing population will keep on increasing the demand for these resources. Other issues being resource scarcity, depleting ore quality and fine mineral particles. Therefore, there is a constant need to improve upon our existing mineral separation processes and also to improve its environmental and economical sustainability. Well, one way to do that is by creating more effective and selective biodegradable chemical reagents that could be used to separate minerals from one another. In my PhD project, I'm working with peptides. Peptides are small biomolecules made up of amino acids. And as you all know, amino acids are the building blocks of our life. These can be arranged in multiple ways to form peptides with different functionalities. Such functionalities then help us to selectively collect or selectively reject the wanted minerals from unwanted minerals. Well, have you ever noticed what difference a water repellent coating makes on a car? Just like a water repellent coating changes the surface properties of the car surface, similarly, these peptides help us to change the surface properties of the mineral surface. For example, here we have an unwanted mineral which hates water. The issue is it loves the air bubbles. So it hops onto the bubbles, flow to the surface, gets collected at the end. But once we treat the same mineral with our peptide solution, it changes its surface properties to now water loving. So our unwanted mineral stays in water and is selectively rejected. From my prelim results, I have discovered that these peptide treated minerals slows down the bubble attachment and therefore preventing its collection. Hence, proving its potential to be used in mineral separation processes by making it much more effective, selective, and environmentally friendly. Therefore, I believe these peptides could be an answer to our greener future. Thank you. Oh, Roop, I hear people like you and I think the future's in good hands. Amazing, well done. Our final finalist for tonight. 
Everybody, please welcome Catherine Anderson, representing UniSA Business. And Catherine's topic? Catherine's topic is, does place matter for entrepreneurship and innovation? We wonder these days if the proof of our humanity lies in our ability to select the squares that show a certain image. Technology allows us to collaborate at distance without the barriers of physical location. We could sit on a tropical beach and start a global company, right? But the truth is there's a very real human side to innovation and entrepreneurship that needs place. For more than a century, economists and geographers have observed that when businesses group together, they do better. Think of the silversmiths of Sheffield, uh, the the leather workers of Italy or the, the techies of Silicon Valley. Shared resources like talent and skills, innovations and technologies help to start new businesses, new industries even. The idea is that there's just something in the air of places like this that makes them successful. But if we simply co-locate the right businesses and people, does it all just happen? Well, this is Tonsley. I was one of the founding members at Tonsley. And places like Tonsley Innovation Districts have become a leading strategy for economic development and rebuilding economies, but at multi-million dollar costs. So I wanted to know how they tick. My comparative case study dives deeply into the qualities that matter for innovation and entrepreneurship. I interviewed entrepreneurs, CEOs, policymakers, and district managers, and I poured over hundreds of websites, media articles, and government documents. And I discovered that simply putting the right ingredients in place is not enough. For innovation districts to really work, they must create layered opportunities for interaction through chance meeting, through design strategies, and through network contacts. The place must connect up the capabilities on site with strategies for economic, for economic priorities. And it needs to tell you who is there, what they do, and how to reach them. And importantly, they require ongoing facilitated effort. Innovation districts are not set and forget strategies. We've long thought that there was just something in the air of places like Silicon Valley. What my research shows is that innovation districts work in three key ways. They change the space of the city, and they focus attention and resources, but they also weave new stories of the work that we do around here and the businesses that we have. And in these ways, they help us to build economies for the future. Thank you. What a cool cat. Well done. Have fun, judges. So tonight we're going to have a Q&A for the next uh, maybe 15 minutes. Um, Hayley, I'm going to ask the question, which is a really obvious one, but probably no one has the courage to ask. Why is the chair called Steve? <laughs> is there a particular rationale? Why Steve? Um, well, uh, I'd love to say that there's some like great uncle the, called Steve that I've attributed this to, but um, it was really just first thought, best thought. Um, <laughs> I was um, I was writing it uh, my my speech, and I knew that I wanted to do like a like a quirky object with like a really not quirky, but like a mundane object and a mundane name. Sorry if anybody's name Steve. I'm so sorry. <laughs> People's choice is done. It's fine. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> So, <laughs> I lost my train of thought. Um, yeah, so then I just, that was my first one because I was spending so long just on that. It was the hardest part of my uh, speech to write was to choose what name and an object. So, um, I was just like, all right, first thought, best thought, and then I'll just, I'll write it later. Um, and then it just stuck. I just couldn't see the chair as anything but Steve. I love Steve. It couldn't be anything else. Um, oh, up the back, yeah, behind me. Hi, congratulations to you all. That was fantastic. Um, my question's actually for Rachel. Um, 
I was just going to ask, I'm always quite, I always find it quite compelling when someone notices something in their working life and, you know, enrolls in a PhD to try and fix it. So I was wondering a little bit about your decision um, to go from being a police officer to being a PhD student. Uh, I guess I've probably reached a point in my career where I was looking to do something different. It's probably really just that simple. Um, being involved in the, the justice system for 20 odd years, you can often see so much wrong. Um, and being able to do this PhD is giving me an opportunity to, I guess, do some right, feeling like I'm, you know, be able to maybe implement some changes down the line. Yeah. Oh, great. Great answer. Questions? While you're thinking, I have got a question for Rani. H hello. What are the next steps for your amazing research? Oh, that's a lovely question. Um, when I started this research, uh, my focus was to make, make it meaningful not just for us as professionals, but for people who come and see us and trust us, um, handle their care to us. So as I have mentioned, I have um, gathered the recommendations from the podiatrists working in the community to see how they are managing it. And now I'm looking at the data to compare and look at that service utilization. So the next step forwards, which I'm hoping to do postdoc, um, would be to actually then back up what our podiatrists have said by some research, which in our world we call evidence-based practice. So I would look into, say for example, whatever treatment options are available for this neuropathy, what is the research behind it, how strong those treatments are, and how will they be effective um, for us to incorporate as clinicians and to help the, survive, the cancer survivors as much as we can with the best that's available out there. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. A question for you, Rupinda. Um, is your research at this stage, is it still just theoretical or have you actually seen it put into practice in the mining industry in a practical way that's actually working and if so, where? I wish so. <laughs> um, <laughs> we are actually part of a bigger group which is Centre of Excellence and we do have different groups uh, which are divided to work on probably similar projects. Um, where my project stands is, uh, it's very fundamental. So what I do is I study the adsorption using different adsorption techniques of these peptides and mineral surfaces. So of course, because it's fundamental, it's not still under practice. But that being said, there are several other groups that are still working um, towards making it much more um, conventional, I would say, uh, and I hope uh, we get there soon before I finish my PhD. I'm not sure, <laughs> but yeah, thanks for the question. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Well done, everyone. Uh, my question is for Catherine. Um, did you have any involvement with the Holden Redevelopment District, or has that played any part in your research? Great, great question. Um, research design is a, an interesting thing to go through, and, and my research design, I saw I started the PhD in 2020. <laughs> it was redesigned a few times <laughs> for yeah. obvious reasons. Um, Holden was one that I did look at. Uh, so my research comes under an Australian Research Council funded project that you might have seen a little in the media about and there's certainly a little bit knocking around in some of the e-newsletters coming out from various government departments that was looking at the exit of automotive in Australia quite broadly. My specific work looks at initially started with looking at repurposing of industrial sites and, and then zoomed in on, on innovation districts. Um, Holden, which is now called Lionsgate, was one that I looked at but the two, the two comparative case studies are actually Tech Park and Tonsley, the, two, the ones that I'm comparing. The reason for that is that they're both, they're both state driven. So I'm really looking at the, the location or the positionality of the state in these places. Holden was bought out by the Polygra group and is, a, is uh, owned privately and is a very different kind of beast now, um, Lionsgate. Um, there'd be so much interesting research to be done there, but. Um, 
I'll, I'll get this one done first. <laughs> Thank you for the question. Great. My question is for Elita. What is the implication for your study? Thank you. I'm aiming for two right now. So basically, my research is about theoretical. So my first implication is to um, giving additional perspective from a different um, in the theories, because mostly right now they're focusing to preserve the physical forms. And then um, with this research, I hope I can show that, hey, the activities is also can say, like preserving the cultural heritage as well, not just the physical form, but the combinations of the physical forms, the activities, and also the, the feelings of the, 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 the community as well. And the second one is the, um, as I'm showing you in the slides, that the, they changes the houses not because, because of the urbanizations and migrations, and they grow, they have to sell their lands to give it to um, new migrants coming in. So doing so, um, they're having, they're being blamed for like, oh, you're not preserving your own culture. So in that, in that way, with this research, I can help the Batawi as well to say that um, actually they're still preserving their culture through their daily activities. Not, although their forms now modern looking, they're still doing their cultural heritage, that kind of thing. So thank you so much for your question. Mm, that's great. Fascinating. Thank you. Um, I have a question for Rachel. So Rachel, um, with your project or your research, what outcomes are you hoping for? What would you like to see? Any changes or anything in particular you'd like to see from this? Great question. Uh, some of the outcomes that I would like to see is some of the, so I'm doing a national sort of sh shot of, of how police um, responding across all of Australia. Uh, and what I would like to see is really less imprisoning of our children, so less incarceration of our, of our young people, um, and looking at therapeutic type of diversions across each state uh, in which children that are displaying these types of behaviours, because they're very complex types of behaviours, uh, that are they're able to be diverted into programs that can actually assist them um, with addressing these types of behaviours rather than just incarcerating them. Mm, great. Hi, Daniel. It's, I'm from CHS, so um, I feel I can ask you a question. I was just interested um, with your studies if you've come across much to do with children that have been in, had cancer and being able to tell their, their stories. Often you have parents that mean the, the best but are, are gatekeepers of allowing children to express mm. themselves. And if you'd come across that and what sort of methods that uh, are used with children? I love that question. So I actually spent three years working with Cam Quality, which is a children's cancer charity. So in this study, I very exclusively kept to people over 18 who had been diagnosed after turning 18. Because um, obviously adults have a lot more autonomy about how they can go about things. Children is a, particularly in the research world, a very difficult area ethically to approach, particularly with such vulnerable children, some of which have a lot of comorbidities too. I've seen so many kids with cancer who have other cognitive and physical disabilities on top of that to deal with that whilst kids are amazing at talking about and openly discussing their situation, um, I would love to do research with kids on this because I think it will open up a whole new world and a very enlightening world for us adults into the cancer space because kids are also incredibly candid and they'll tell it how it is, um, which I loved in my time working in Camp Quality. But yeah, as to the methodology of approaching that, you know, that is something I'll definitely think about more. But again, once I'm done with the adults. <laughs> Brilliant. Now, I'm going to make an executive decision and say that all questions are finished, I'm sorry, um, because um, our judges have finished their judging. So let's get on with announcing the winners. Um, please thank our fantastic finalists.
We'll start with people's choice. And um, our people's choice winner tonight and winner of a $1,000 research grant is Sindrani Das. <laughs> So thrilled for you, Sindrani. Great. Our runner-up tonight and second place, winner of a, another $1,000 research grant, is Rachel Lever. <laughs> And our 3MT winner tonight, who goes on to represent UniSA in the Asia-Pacific Finals, winner of a $3,000 research grant, our first place winner is Catherine Anderson. <laughs> Uh, please join me in congratulating again our uh, three winners, but also all of our seven finalists who have just been outstanding tonight. And that draws tonight to a close, I'm afraid, everybody. Thank you so much for making tonight such a fantastic event. We really appreciate you coming. A special thank you to our judges, John Hill, Laura Hodgson, David Waugh and Claire Petty. Um, have a safe trip home and yay, go guys. Thank you very much.